So you're very welcome, everyone, to the next episode of the Paving the Way Home podcast and delighted to be joined again by uh, uh, turning into be a regular guest, Father Philip Kemi from the Diocese of Raffo. Father Philip, you're very welcome. How are you? Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, hello to everyone uh, listening in or watching. Oh, no, thank you so much for, for, for giving you your time. I know you're a busy man. And we're today we're going to be doing part two of um of an episode on baptism on the sacrament of baptism now i know we did part one uh it was actually a couple of months ago and uh, i know i hope to do part two uh sooner but that was completely my fault <laughs> and i know i i i the reason we had to do a back to a, a, a part two was because i i kept you chatting the last one but anyway we'll we'll stick to we'll stick to today um because i know a, a lot of the conversation in part one was very much um I suppose the whole reason we were focusing on the sacrament of baptism was regarding uh, just a little bit of a, not, I won't say a controversial topic, but an, an episode that happened in the United States where a priest was uh, looking over a video recording of his baptism and realized when he heard the words of the priest was speaking, well, he realized, oh gosh, this is not a valid, ba a valid baptism yet. Here I am ordained a priest. So I think that took up a, a lot of discussion, the last one. Um, but so uh, for anyone who hasn't seen part one, that's going to be in the description box uh, below. So we're going to be continuing on from there in this episode. So where we finished the last time, we were just approaching uh, the baptismal font during the baptismal service. Um, so over to you, Father. Yes, well, we left off with the profession of faith. Um, and uh, so the, you know, do you reject Satan and then do you believe uh the different articles of the creed and we spoke then about uh, the necessity of having godparents that are in some way shape or form believers and preferably the stronger the believer the better um, and uh, so then the uh, the child is brought to the baptismal font um, and one final I suppose you might say check-in is, uh, is uh, given by the priest when he says to the parents and godparents he says and we'll just presume the child's name is Mary. So parents and godparents, is it your will that Mary should be baptized in the faith of the church, which we have all professed with you? And then they respond, it is. And so this is this is the, the church in the person of the, the priest or the minister of baptism saying, so you've professed the faith of the church. This is the faith of the church. Uh, we're proud to profess it in Christ Jesus. Our Lord is immediately precedes this part, and He asks the parents and godparents, he asks, "Do you want it? Do you want this child to be baptized, to be fully immersed into the faith of the Church, which which you have professed and we have professed together?" And if they say yes to that, then suddenly the right. baptismal font uh, becomes the focus of our attention because immediately now the baptismal rite happens and it can take about five seconds you spoke about that priest you know uh, it's 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 a very small window and um, it's a, a triple triple immersion if it was full immersion baptism or triple pouring um, and takes maybe five seconds but must be done with that triple pouring of the water and the triple invocation of the uh, the blessed trinity and so the child is held over the baptismal font and the the the, the minister of baptism while pouring the water speaks the words uh, so in this case mary i baptize you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and that five seconds that changes little Mary's entire eternity. What happens at that moment is that the Holy Spirit takes possession of her soul and that he, in a certain sense, he marks, I think we spoke of that in the other video, he marks little Mary's soul with, with this mark of glory and this mark of belonging. So recently one of our youth ministry team was explaining this to, uh, I suppose, 12 year olds. And she used a, a, a nice image uh, that, you know, very often maybe we get uh, gifts at Christmas or, 
or even our school books and that. And we, we, we put our, we write our name on these objects so that it's clear to everyone that this object belongs to, to us. And in a certain sense with baptism, the Lord writes his name upon our souls and, and really and truly claims us as belonging to him, not in a possession, not like a slave, but really and truly as, as a son or daughter of his, his beloved son, his beloved daughter. So we might look at water and, um, you know, we can't use milk. We can't use, you know, Diet Coke. We can't use beer or tea here in Ireland, you know. Uh, it's water that must be used. Um, and if you were to use another substance, then uh, even if you get the words right, the baptism would be invalid. Uh, so I like to look at water at the natural level, three things that water can do. And they, in a certain sense, point to the spiritual work that is being done by the Holy Spirit through the waters of baptism. So the first thing is that we use water for washing. You know, we wash our cars, we wash ourselves, we wash our windows, you know, we cleanse things with water. So at the natural level, water cleanses, purifies. At the supernatural level, the water of life, the, the, the living water that is the Holy Spirit, cleanses the soul. Now, uh, little Mary is an infant and little Mary doesn't have any personal sins that need to be cleansed. Uh, but she does have, as all of us have, um, barring not little Mary, but the great Mary, Our Lady, barring uh, our ble the Blessed Virgin, um, except for her, every one of us um, is conceived with this original sin being passed on. And that's a whole theological thing to get into. We'll not get into that right now, but um, uh, little Mary or little John, who's there for, for baptism, that uh, stain of original sin is also washed away. If little Mary or little John wasn't so little and they were maybe 20, 25 years of age and, and had lived quite a wild life perhaps and come to Christ and come for baptism at that age, then the waters of baptism would also cleanse all of their personal sins as well. Obviously the little infant has no personal sin. But if you're an adult coming for baptism, that water uh, would cleanse you and uh, would, would, would purify your soul so that it is a worthy temple into which the Holy Spirit uh, comes and dwells and delights to be there. Um, so water at the natural level washes at the supernatural level. There is a washing a spiritual washing, spiritual cleansing and purification that is happening with uh, the waters of baptism. Next thing that water does at the natural level is it gives life. Without water, we have a desert. And a desert, by definition, is, you know, quite a uh, hostile, if not even deadly place. Um, so water brings life. And so uh, the water... The water washes over the head of the little child to be baptized, but the Holy Spirit fills his or her soul with divine life, the grace of God. And so they are alive in a new way. They are spiritually reborn. We talk about baptism being a rebirth. And so they are born anew. And uh, so a new life begins for them. That's why I said, you know, those five seconds of that baptism has, has a bearing on all of eternity because a new life has begun. In a certain sense, um, the parents bring a child to the uh, baptismal font, uh, to the church that day for baptism, and they take a different child home. <laughs> Um, not because there are several children being baptized and they've mixed them up, but uh, because they bring to the church a child who is theirs at the, at the natural level. 
a gift from God, a precious, beautiful gift from God made in the image and likeness of God. But they take away with them from the, the church that day a newly baptized child, a child who is now supernaturally and primarily a son or daughter of God. Um, and so that's why there's, there's a new life going on. That would be perhaps more visible in the life of a 25-year-old who's coming for baptism. They would say, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a new person now. I've, I've changed direction in my life. It's not so visible um, in the life of an infant, okay? Uh, but, but if it was an adult baptism, that, 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 uh, that difference might be very, very uh, apparent and very, very visible to us. So that's water washes, and at the supernatural level, the water of baptism washes. Water brings life at the natural level. At the supernatural level, the waters of baptism begin that supernatural life of the soul, of union with God, of being a child of God. And then the third thing that water can do, I mean, water can do many things, but the third thing I'll point you today is, and this is kind of, it sounds kind of negative, but water can kill if you hold somebody under the water long enough, they'll drown, they'll die. So water is pretty powerful. It has the power to give life, but it also has the power to bring death. And indeed this, I mean, St. Paul talks about this idea of in baptism, we died with Christ and rose again. And think of, you know, the baptism, the triple uh, pouring of water, but originally i suppose the more ancient way was the immersion they went down into the water and up again down and up so in honor of the blessed trinity and in honor of the three days of the lord in the tomb there is this triple immersion in the waters that bring a death a new life death and new life death and new life so once again the person, you don't really see that apparent in the life of the child, though it's, it is there in the, in the spiritual realm, but in the day-to-day -day life of someone who's perhaps an adult coming for baptism, you will perhaps see that new life being lived. They're not the person they were at 23, now they're 25 and they're coming to Christ and they're baptized. And they might even say, oh, the old me, the old me is dead. I'm a, I'm a new person, I'm a new person. And they would be living differently. And people might say, well, what happened to the old you? The, this, is, this is not the one I knew. Because, and they might actually say, well, you know, that person's gone. I'm not that same person anymore. So there is a sort of a, a death um, uh, that would be more apparent uh, maybe in an adult than, than in a child. Um, or certainly more apparent in an adult. Just, uh, just to come in there with a slight side note, what you say there is fantastic. Because like, even every time we come to receive Jesus in the Eucharist, we leave after receiving a changed person. But even we think back to scripture, the wise men came to uh, pay homage to the child Jesus. And we all, we all hear they went back, obviously to avoid Herod, they went back uh, a different way. And I remember hearing it before for someone saying, well, that's exactly, just as you're explaining it there, that's exactly what happens when we come to a personal encounter with Jesus, we leave changed, we go back a different way to the way we approached. Um, sorry, I just had to want to put that in because what you're saying there was very much reminding me of that. And that, that living a different way is rooted in God having begun something new in us. And so uh, the ultimate or the, the principle or the main new thing that God's doing in us is our baptism. Of course, when we come to other sacraments, for example, confession, we're, we're made new as well. We have this restoration and this purification happening, but it's all rooted in our baptism. We, 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 we have encounters with Christ, perhaps, you know, we're at a retreat or perhaps we're at mass one day and we hear the word of God and it strikes us and provokes us to change direction. All of that really is um, drawing on that, that ultimate change that God has brought about in us in our baptism and um, so uh, this this new way of living obviously uh, the little child can be uh, baptized and and we don't see this radical change in, in, in lifestyle because obviously the, the child is is still at a very very uh, um, simple stage of his or her um, development of her personality and life and ability to actually uh, uh, live life they're still very dependent uh, on their on their parents uh, and that but 
the 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 change that we that we see in uh, in in people really it's it, it's it's brought about by God. I kind of lost my train of thought there, but the the idea yeah, is yeah. that that we God wants us to be different, and we want to live differently. And and uh, the, getting back to my train of thought, the child. Um, you don't see this massive change, but maybe later on in life, he or she will not practice the faith, will not walk with the Lord. Um, and uh, so that's the personal decision to follow Christ. Um, unfortunately, maybe the child is brought for baptism and that's their first real powerful encounter with Christ. But if they don't encounter Christ daily in their home, uh, in their community of faith, because maybe they're not being brought to have access to that community of faith, then, you know, we can't really expect them to live that new life if they're not even told that there is a new life. If the baptism is reduced to, oh, that's the day we give you your name, or that's the day you became a member of God's family or a child of God, but they're not actually given the tools to uh, to unpack that. Um, and, uh, you know, that that the parents should communicate to the children how precious they are in God's eyes. They communicate, obviously, unless they're some kind of monstrous parents, they will communicate to their children how precious the children are in their own eyes, that you're, you're my son, you're my daughter, I love you, and, and there's so much affirmation and love and, uh, and that, that that goes into parenting. Uh, but also to, to broaden the horizon or the vision of that child to, to realize that they have a heavenly father and by extension, they have a heavenly mother uh, or lady as well, and um, to see that they are part of this vast family network, which spans not only every nation on earth, but also all the expanse of time. Um, and that they are part of this, this vast family but they are loved as if they're the only member of the family, that they are loved absolutely and utterly by God. Um, and uh, so that has to be communicated uh, to, to the child so that he or she is enabled then to live that new life uh, that, that baptism opens up for them. What really strikes me there uh, as well is, and um, without um, meaning to go, to go off topic a bit, is actually the the power of authority that God has given to the parents insofar as I was just spoke there, obviously the child is an innocent child, doesn't know what's going on. So the parents make that decision for the child that we want to, you, we want, we want to bring you into the Christian community. We want to have you baptized as opposed to waiting for the person to be an adult um, and for them deciding themselves. And I've heard myself from, you know, from friends who may not be practicing the faith, but always, you know, be asking you various questions and thinking, well, surely the the most charitable thing is to allow the person to, to grow up to be an adult and decide for themselves. But when you're listening to exactly to how you're explaining what's happening there, what an awesome act of charity and of love to decide, you know what, what's happening there? Let's, let, let's, 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 bring the child into the Christian community now, let's mark it with God, so to speak. Um, it's powerful. And when we think back, say, or when I think back to my parents' times uh, and my father, like the, more or less from the day after they were born, they were taken straight out of the hospital to be baptized. And sometimes, you know, the mother might be still still recovering, but the father um, took it straight, because even back then they had a real, real sense of, you know what, the ultimate thing is, even maybe in case, uh, I don't know, maybe a child dies very early, God forbid, or whatever, but like, let's baptize them now. Let's mark them with that stamp of God, so to speak. Uh, and there was that real sense of understanding and being in awe of the sacred action that was happening in baptism. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think of uh, back to all of our childhood, we, we were waiting for Christmas. We couldn't wait for Christmas. You know, it's like, Okay, Halloween is over. Christmas is coming. Wish it would come. Wish it would come. Wish it would come. And we're we're longing for that day of Christmas to come. And every day it's delayed. We're like, oh, 
it's 10 more days to Christmas, so nine more days to Christmas. And we have this kind of excitement because of this festivity that we're going to enter into. We should have a similar or even more um, of this longing for union with God. Why would we want to delay it? You know, uh, there before Christmas, somebody talked about uh, in the pandemic, you know, of delaying Christmas, um, bringing it into January or something, which we couldn't do as a Christian feast. But, you know, could you imagine how disappointed not just the children, but everyone would have been if we said, OK, we're going to celebrate Christmas in January on January 10th because, you know, we're kind of the numbers are too high. People would have been so disappointed because that's another delay for something that they're waiting on. Well, why would we delay union with God? Um, and so as best we can, we, we bring the child to the baptismal font because of the, the great gift that it is. Um, that union with God that it forges in the soul of, of the newly baptized. And, you know, the, the question of, you know, letting them wait until they're older. Well, I don't think there's, there are any parents who allow their children to wait until they're older to make some major decisions in their life. Like, they don't say, well, you know, when the child decides its education is important, then he, can, he or she can choose to go to school or whatever school they want to go to. We, like, you know, and nobody asks the little, you know, nine month old, well, you know, what, what clothing do you want to wear? You know, you know, we don't, we don't sort of say, well, you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to put any clothes on the child until he or she decides whether uh, they like this color or that color. And, um, you know, and these are, these are important decisions, but the most important decision of all is, union with God um, and so parents decide an enormous they have that and we talk about that authority they decide an enormous amount of things that will affect their children for the rest of their lives this decision as I said at the beginning doesn't affect them just for their life it affects them for the rest of eternity so, you know, I, I'm not in favor of, of saying, well, you know, let, let him turn 15 and make the decision himself uh, for that. Uh, let's give him the union with God. And then at a later stage, he or she will have to, uh, have to make that decision to carry that faith themselves. We'll come to that when we get to the, I suppose, to the, the lighted candle. Um, but, you know, give them that gift now. Um, obviously, if it means anything to you, then give that gift to them, uh, that gift of union with God, new life in Christ, and uh, the, the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, and all of the blessings of heaven uh, upon them. You know, when, when Jesus was baptized in the, in the River Jordan, you know, heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended, and God the Father spoke over him and said, you are my beloved son, uh, in whom I delight. But the next line in the gospel doesn't say, and the heavens closed over again. In a certain sense, it kind of almost hints at the fact that Jesus began his public ministry and above him at all times with this open heaven. And the same is true for us. So why would we not want our children to have this direct access to an open heaven where their heavenly father is all day, every day? And that is a reality, that wellspring, that, that opening is uh, is 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 begun at baptism so why delay it that's very well put actually i never thought of that before that uh when the heavens opened they, they never closed back over afterwards that was um that struck me there that was that was fantastic um just before we move on to the next stage we've spoken there uh just at the very beginning of you know a situation that made the baptism invalid um you know, so often we may hear of, you know, parents or godparents might make, you know, they make these promises uh, when the priests ask them and they make these promises before God that, yes, they will, uh, they will nourish the faith of the, um, of the child and, 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 you know, bring the child into the Christian community and the godparents will, will, will assist in that. If that promise is being made, but 
maybe in in the back of their minds they know for whatever reason look we don't really have any intention of doing so or whatever does that cause a problem I, like I, what i guess what i'm saying is that the, the baptism is still valid yes yeah. the ba- it doesn't it doesn't present a problem from the point of view of the validity of the baptism uh, it does present a promise from the, the the point of view of the child being able to grow in that faith and live that faith. Um, and uh, so I don't have the kind of law books open in front of me, but I think there has to be at least some hope that the child will be brought up in the faith in order for a baptism to proceed. If, you know, uh, if there's no, if there's no Christian community, as in, in the family life and the family inner circle, if there's no hope or no uh, way in which there's going to be any input about the faith, then uh, it would be better to defer that baptism. Um, rather, and he hears me saying this after saying, you know, don't delay, but you're giving, you're giving them the keys of the kingdom while uh, in a certain sense, barring them from getting near the door um, and uh, so you know the parents have a little bit of a journey to make uh, with that you know um, so you know some might say well better than baptized than, than not but that's highly that's, that's hardly ideal that uh, you know you end up with um, a child who is baptized but doesn't know anything whatsoever about christ and is not going to be given the opportunity to know anything about christ and um, then you're just into just a sort of sacramentalizing somebody but not actually catechizing them or enabling them to to live the the life of faith that is planted in seed form in their soul at that at, at baptism uh, so it must be nourished and nurtured and and grown because it's a disservice to the child um, not to do that um, so, and I, I guess like, <clears throat> like, like anything, like any gift, there's a responsibility that goes with it. So even if somebody um, comes to the door for a celebration or whatever, and they give us a gift to mark the occasion, even though we have our own gift of free will to do with that what we want once we receive it, there's still a kind of responsibility to use it for the purpose that it was it was given for you um for example if if you know I, i'm just thinking off the cuff here if someone gave me a you know the gift of I don't, a book a, a bible and instead i'm i'm looking at it going you know what that's handy that will that'll prevent the the car from rolling back so i'll stick it under the wheel or whatever instead of actually using it for the for the purpose i have the gift of free will to to do that to to misuse it but it, it, there's still a responsibility on us. And um, uh, yeah, so sorry, that's just striking me there as, as you're speaking. Yeah, yeah. well, if you're given a book and you don't know what a book is, uh, you might use it for uh, as, as a, an auxiliary <laughs> brake on your car because um, you don't know what it is. So, you know, you're given baptism, you don't know what it is. You know, oh, way back then I was baptized, but I know nothing about, I know the word. And that's about it, you know, and you might just reduce it to, well, that's the day I was given my name. Um, and that would be a sad reality if this great, great gift was uh, undervalued, not through any malice, but just through the fact that you are ignorant of it because nobody told you. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great gift, but there is, uh, the parents are asked do you want this gift for your child? But they're also required to facilitate the growth of that gift. Um, and so there's a, there's a double uh, thing going on there that obviously the child can't ask for it for themselves, uh, but the parents must value it in some way so that they themselves will say, okay, this gift has been given to this child and I will do my utmost to, uh, to, to ensure that it grows. Excellent. Okay. So, we're at the stage where you baptize the child with with the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so where do we where do we go to from here? Right. Um, well, the center of the sacrament is that. Okay, the pouring of the water and the speaking of the words of baptism. Everything else in the baptismal rite before that and after, it's not that it's optional, but it is not 
essential. The essential is the water and the words. Um, and so everything that has come before that part of the rite of baptism is a preparation for the baptism. Everything now that happens after the actual baptism um, is, it's a ritual that in a certain sense can be used to unpack in our hearts and minds at the level of faith, what has just happened to this child. Um, so it's, it's almost like uh, a reinforcement of, okay, do you realize what has just happened? Um, and uh, so immediately after baptism, the next thing is the oil of chrism. Uh, the oil of chrism is one of the uh, three holy oils that are blessed on Holy Thursday, the morning of Holy Thursday, by the bishop in the cathedral. And then the, these three oils are distributed uh, out to all the parishes in the diocese. Um, and the oil of chrism is uh, used for a few sacraments. It's used at baptism. It's used at confirmation. And it's also used at the ordination of priests. Um, so the oil of chrism is, um, I always think of it as linked with mission, linked with a, a purpose. So it's used sacramentally, the three sacraments that, that I can think of offhand that it's used for is baptism, confirmation, and uh, ordination to the priesthood. Um, also a bishop, when he's ordained a bishop, he has the oil of chrism poured over his head. Um, but outside of those sacraments, there are other times when the oil of chrism is used as well. So when a Catholic church is built and is uh, made ready to, uh, for, for, to be opened for as a house of worship, um, usually the bishop will come and the bishop will take the oil of chrism and he will anoint the altar of the church with the oil of chrism. And he will also anoint the walls of the church building with the oil of chrism. The idea behind it is that the Holy Spirit, the oil of chrism is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is setting this building apart. It's consecrated. So it's setting, setting this building apart for a particular mission. And the mission of this building is to be the house of God in this parish. Um, when in, uh, traditionally, when kings and queens uh, were uh, at their coronation, the oil of chrism was put on their head. The idea was that the Holy Spirit was setting them aside for a particular mission to serve and protect his people, the people that they were sovereign over. Uh, and so now we know that many kings and queens self-serve. They didn't necessarily serve, but the idea of the oil of chrism was that they would serve the people that they would be uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, set apart from the Holy Spirit for that role, to have that authority and that sovereignty over a uh, portion of the people of God. Uh, priests, when we're ordained, um, uh, after, the, after we're ordained, we present our hands to the bishop and he anoints our hands with the oil of chrism. The idea, once again, that the mission of the priest is to pass on the blessing of God to God's people. So the oil of chrism, mission, always mission oriented uh, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is how I like to, to think of it and how I like to explain it. Um, with the confirmation, the oil of oil of chrism, you know, we're on the forehead, the bishop anoints the, uh, the confirmandi on the forehead and be, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit, or I think that's how the wording, I, I haven't done any confirmations, I don't think so, or may I did, I did once, so, um, and, uh, you know, the idea is that through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, this person is going to really live now for themselves and taking ownership of living the faith fully for the glory of God. Um, and so the oil of chrism now placed on the crown of the head of the child after um, baptism, it has this notion that the Holy Spirit has begun something new. We talked about that new life, something new in the life of this child, and that he has a particular purpose in mind. The plan of God 
for this child is now beginning to unfold under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit. Once again, we're talking about that open heaven of the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus. Well, you know that this that that this child is now going to walk the walk of faith empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I often say to parents, you know, we don't know what the next 90 to 100 years will bring in the life of this child. Uh, you know, who he or she will be. Will there be a great mover and shaker on the world stage? You know, will they be world famous and do this? Or will it just be just simple uh, little John who lives down the street, you know, and he married uh, Patricia mm -hmm. and, you know, they have three kids. Ordinary. But the oil of chrism is there to communicate that there's nothing ordinary about that. I think as John Chrysostom says, uh, there's nothing so extraordinary as an ordinary man and an ordinary woman living an ordinary fam family life. Um, you know, it's an extraordinary thing. And so not everyone will be on the world stage, but every single one has their place in God's plan and has a mission that God will fulfill through them. And if little John who is baptized doesn't do that, then it might remain undone. And so the oil of chrism is, set, is saying this child is now set apart for the glory of God. We wait in joyful wonder to see how his or her life will unfold for the glory of God and what God will accomplish with him and in him and through him or her in their heart, walking with Christ. So. It's just this, it's, it's a simple little ritual, the oil of chrism. Um, the words that are said is, God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, given you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit. So the freed from sin is the, the cleansing bit, given you a new, new birth by water and the Holy Spirit. So that's that life and death thing. Um, and welcomed you into his holy people. So you're a member of the family of God. Um, he now anoints you with the chrism of salvation. As Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and king, so may you live always as a member of his body, sharing everlasting life. So there's this triple thing of priest, prophet, and king. Jesus is the one high priest. We only have one priest in our faith. And that is Jesus Christ. I won't go into the theology of the ministerial priesthood and the common priesthood, but we are all united with Christ the priest and have our mission and our way of living out that union with, with Christ. Uh, a prophet is not, sometimes we think a prophet is someone who uh, foretells the future. And that's not, a uh, prophet I like to say is, is someone who speaks God's w uh, way of thinking about something. Uh, it kind of speaks God's wisdom into something or speaks how, tells, declares how God views a particular circumstance. Um, and so we are to speak um, words to the world around us. Uh, you know, the scriptures talk about reading the signs of the times. We have to look at the world around us and declare, speak God's gospel, his holy word into, into the circumstances that we, uh, that we see. So there's a prophetic action that we have to do. And then king, we're royal people. You know, our, our heavenly father, you know, runs the universe. Uh, our brother is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We, we're, we're not uh, insignificant. We are members of the royal family. We're not just subjects of the kingdom. We are, St. Paul tells us, we are co-heirs with Christ. In other words, what's his is ours. So his kingship, his kingdom, his relationship with the father. We're co-heirs with him. That's why we have the same spirit as Christ. So the same Holy Spirit that uh, was in Christ and was on Christ is in us and upon us. Um, and uh, him by nature, us by grace, by a gift of God. But we are co-heirs with Christ. So the oil of chrism, the prayer that accompanies that, putting on that oil of chrism is is trying to point out that the little John who's been baptized looks like any other child, but he's not ordinary because there are no ordinary people from God's point of view. Every single one of us, every 
is uh, is this a word? Irrepeatable? I don't know. Unrepeatable? Whatever. Uh, unrepeatable um, manifestation of God's creative love. Um, you know, there's no one like you, Brian. There never has been and there never will be. Um, you know, no one will, you know, glorify God the way you do because you are uniquely you. In the same way, no one will offend God the way you do either because you're uniquely you. We're, we're absolutely unique. There's nothing ordinary about us at all. You know, there's a current of thought to serve, you know, we're one of seven and a half billion or whatever. That is not God's vision of things. Um, you know, every one of us um, is, is a unique manifestation of God's awesome creative power um, and his love and his mercy and his grace working. Uh, I often think, you know, uh, in heaven, you know, when we, we meet the saints, and I don't mean just the saints who are canonized, but, you know, your ordinary, ordinary mm. saint, okay? Um, almost contradict myself there, you know, but the, your ordinary saint who will never be canonized, but you'll meet him or her. And in some way, since he or she is so unique, you will look at them and, and, and know their life story and how God's grace wove its way in through their life to get them to heaven. And in some way, you will have a deeper insight to how great and awesome and wondrous God is by looking at that person, the end result of God's grace, bringing them to glory in heaven. Um, so, you know, we are not nothing. We are, uh, we are not mm. ordinary. We're, uh, we're an extraordinary, um, just by our humanity, made in the image and likeness of God, we're extraordinary with, with baptism. We're raised to a new level, um, a glorious level. Um, and uh, like St. Catherine of Siena, I think, had a, had a vision of a soul in a state of grace. I may have said this in the other video, I can't remember. but um, And she was just overcome by the glory that she saw shining out of this soul, this baptized soul that was in a state of grace. And she said that if she didn't know her catechism, she might have thought that this soul was God, that this was the, a fourth person of the Trinity. And, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the gift that is given to us, priest, prophet, and king, this union with God uh, that we don't value enough. I don't value it enough. I can honestly say I do not value my baptism enough. And um, God give me the grace to value it more because I would live vastly differently. Um, and uh, so it's just uh, that simple little ritual. Once again, takes 10 seconds, but it's, there's a lot there in, in that ritual of the anointing with chrism. You're talking there about the saints. Is it, is it correct in saying so, like when, when, from the moment then that a, that, that a person is baptized, they're wash free of original sin. At that moment, they are literally a living saint. Is, yes. is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And it's probably I mean, the, the, it, it, the, in the scripture, St. Paul writes to the the communities and he says the saints, you know, it wasn't like they were adults and I'm sure there was daily sin there. But we are we're the word saint actually means holy. Um, and God alone is holy. But if we are consecrated to God, if we're in union with God, then by definition, we are holy. That doesn't mean that we're all Mother Teresa, you know, or we're all you know, uh, St. Therese or, or uh, St. Philip Neri or some of these great saints, you know, um, but by our baptism, we are made holy. So there's this, um, objectively, we are holy. Subjectively, um, we may on any particular day be doing and thinking and uh, speaking in a way that is not so holy. Um, but by our baptism, we are made holy. And therefore, that's why we have to live that life that is um, not in contradiction with that. Uh, so it, it, it matters when, when we sin. Uh, it's, 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 it's much more serious when the baptized person sins um, because he or she has the life of God within. Uh, he or she has uh, the grace of the, this sacrament and access to all the other sacraments that come with it. He or she should have a basic, at least a basic relationship with God. And so this is, uh, this is not, you know, if 
there's a difference even in our relationships. If somebody comes along and insults you, Brian, just a complete stranger on the street, doesn't like the look of you and says some harsh word to you, some insult to you, you know, you'll be offended. And then you move on. You sort of go, well, I uh, wonder what his, his problem is. But if it's your wife who says this to you, well, that's a, that's a much more serious, you know, that you'll not move on from that, uh, you know, just so, so easily because there is that union there, uh, which makes the same words, the same insult. It makes it more serious. And um, because we have, we, we should know better. Uh, we could do better because God's grace is alive and active in our souls. And um, so we, uh, you know, we have, uh, we have a great uh, gift, but we also have a great responsibility to, to, to live in a way that is not contradictory to that, that, that gift. And, um, uh, you know, the, if you think of something like, you know, some of the European royalty in that, you know, if one of them goes out on a Saturday night and, you know, gets crazy drunk and does stupid things, on Sunday morning, chances are the front page of the tabloid newspapers will have a photograph of Prince so-and-so or Princess so-and-so lying in a gutter off their head drunk, okay? And yet maybe 100,000 other people that very same night did the exact same thing, but they don't arrive in the newspaper, never mind on the front page. Why? Because there's an expectation that given the status of that royal personage, that he or she has a higher standard, is called to live differently, um, has, uh, you know, has been in a certain sense invested with a, uh, with, with a dignity. The people say, okay, you're royalty, you know, so you have a certain dignity. Um, and that, that for us, we have a higher dignity than any blue blood, you know? So uh, we, our, our baptism elevates us way beyond any kind of earthly royalty. And so we have to realize our dignity. This gets back to the idea of whether the parents are going to raise this child in the faith so that he or she knows their dignity, knows what's, uh, what's expected of them but also knows that heaven is open above them, God is with them, and he never abandons them, even though at times we know, as with all of us, they may abandon him for a time in their life. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot in a little ritual. It's amazing, though, as I'm listening to you there, like, I, I just thought this is a fascinating topic, and listening to you there, like, even we have three children our our last was born uh on the i should know the day i don't know why i said this now i should know the day it's the 20 something of july last and like straight away lan and i we, we wanted a child baptized asap um uh, and we did it within a, a a couple of weeks we had chosen specifically chosen godparents and we've done with each of the children that we know that would take the role seriously would pray for the children and would 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 try and be a part in their life to help develop in their relationship to god and help get them to heaven um one during that baptism uh back in august at, at that time okay travel was open in ireland but at the time there was two counties gone into lockdown kildare was one of them and the godmother uh of, of elise was actually in kildare so she couldn't travel out so we we then got uh and actually the godfather who was who was my brother who was only up the road he was really really sick uh at the time and because he didn't know it was a COVID or not and waiting for the, the test uh he couldn't come so we then had two other people stand in their place but yet they're still the godmother and godfather um I know your time is really short now. I just wanted to <laughs> touch on that topic because sometimes, uh, sometimes people, you know, they'll, they'll pick people. And if the person 
for some reason can't make it or due to travel or whatever circumstances, people think, okay, well, now I have to go and get somebody completely different to be the godparent for the rest of their life. But it is possible to have other people stand in for, yes, for, proxy, for that day. Proxy. Yes, yes, it is. Um, so you can have, <laughs> have somebody stand in for the day in, uh, in, in place of the person who, who can't make it, the, the godparent who can't make it. Yeah, uh, that is uh, possible, yes. Yeah. And, I mean, you would like to no, have that, the godparents like. there that are the actual godparents, uh, yeah. but, you know, certainly in, in these pandemic times, uh, but even in, in ordinary times, things can happen. You know, somebody can wake up in the morning and they're sick and it's the day of the baptism, but they're, you know, they're, they're got uh, uh, a real bad, I don't know, stomach bug or something and they, they can't, well, you know, then somebody else steps into the, in their place, but not into their role. Into their role. Yeah, that's amazing. So like this has been a, such a fascinating talk because listening to it, I'm just thinking of, like I've been to so many baptisms now and yet how you take it for granted and I'm just realizing is, wow, you haven't even realized what's fully going on here. It's like, it just, this talk has been getting the heart going. It's like, it's fantastic and it, it's challenging as well. So we're at the part now where uh, we're, we're moving on. Are we to light the candle? We are now at the white garment, clothing of white garment. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Yeah, yes. the white garment. So usually they have the, uh, some kind of maybe white shawl or white kind of blanket, or uh, sometimes now they have these kind of christening bibs that are almost like the food bibs, but white and or nice and ornate and that. So then the, the child is clothed in this white garment. And um, this is of ancient origin. And um, so I don't know if you know, now we tend to call the Sunday after uh, Easter Sunday, uh, Divine Mercy Sunday. But it was called uh, White Sunday. Uh, now, I'm going to get this, I'm going to butcher this in Latin, but Domenica in Albis. And the idea was that at the Easter vigil um, in the, like in the third century and that, um, the, all the people would be baptized and then they would be clothed in white and they would wear the white for the whole week. And then the following Sunday, they would come to the church uh, dressed in white. So for that eight days after the baptism, they were dressed in white. The idea was, um, well, it was, uh, I suppose, a symbol of innocence. So, you know, that sin, they'd done away with sin, they'd renounced Satan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so innocence, purity, holiness, this idea of white. And so the white garment is placed on the child to show externally what is the internal reality, the interior reality of the soul. Uh, so the, the words on it are, so we'll say, John, you have become a new creation and have clothed yourself in Christ. See in this white garment, the outward sign of your Christian dignity with your family and friends to help you by word and example, bring that dignity unstained into the everlasting life of heaven. So the idea is, you know, we take for granted, you know, that we, we, the, the soul is in a state of grace. It's beautiful. You know, as you mentioned, saintly, uh, that little saint that, that, you know, it's inevitable that they're going to uh, destroy that life of grace. Well, it's inevitable given our weak human nature that in small ways we might have some level of staining on our souls. But it is important that we, we uh, instruct uh, sufficiently our children and young people that they would never discard their garment of grace. Uh, by that I mean mortal sin, um, which can be restored again through the, uh, through the sacrament of confession and that, but that, uh, you know, while it is inevitable that there will be small stains, that we wash those stains in, in the blood of Jesus through the sacrament of confession so that we will that arrive in heaven with our garment of glory, the interior garment of the soul of glory, um, perfectly white, washed clean in the blood of the Lamb and intact. And so that we enter in fully clothed in Christ so that our Christian dignity has not been discarded and that our union with uh, with Christ has not been broken 
uh, or not remain broken if it has been broken at any stage in our life. So it's a little kind of a reminder that externally we see this lovely white blanket wrapped around the child, uh, but internally what we are seeing there is the the wrapping of the holiness, purity, and might of the Holy Spirit around their soul, um, and parents have the task to to guard that purity and innocence as best they can for as long as they can. And in today's world, um, it's almost I'm, I'll say this controversially. It's almost like uh, childhood has been prolonged because you're now 29 and you're still childish, but the innocence of childhood has been reduced. So it's like uh, we, 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 we the, it seems like the longer we treat people like children or allow them to act or behave like children, uh, um, the shorter the time is before we allow their innocence to be interfered with. And there's so much in our world that, uh, that can rob the innocence of, of this beautiful little child, can scandalize um, uh, the child's purity and innocence of soul. Not through the fault of the child. I'm not talking about the child sinning. I'm talking about this sinful world that just bombards and, uh, mm -hmm. and robs of, of innocence so, so quickly and so easily, unfortunately. Um, uh, but uh, the parent's task is to really guard that uh, and protect and, 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 and have circumstances around the child that protect that child for as long as possible from the, the worst that the world has. You know, we can't wrap them in cotton wool and sort of, you know, uh, lock them away from the rest of the world. But uh, until they are sufficiently strong to stand themselves firmly in Christ, we have to make sure that things that are not of Christ are not influencing their hearts and minds that are so beautifully pure and, and, uh, and open to God. Um, and uh, so um, all of that in that white garment, their dignity, their purity, their holiness is there. Parents, do your best to keep that intact and to bring them to an awareness that it's their task as they grow older to defend that union with God at all costs. Um, so, yeah, that's it might just look like you're putting on a little white blanket, but there's a lot more going on there. Yeah. Gosh, like from a parent's point of view, like no easy task and what a challenge, what a challenge. But uh, it's fascinating. I just love the symbol. And I don't mean everything is just symbolic as if nothing has actually happened, but the symbolism to mark what's actually happening that the eye can see. Uh, it's fascinating, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And so from there, then, I'm um, we're moving on to the candle, is it? We're moving on to the candle. This is going to be the longest of all of your talks on, on, on uh, Paving Way Home. <laughs> so we'll get there. Um, so uh, we have the Easter candle. There's a lot in this one. <laughs> so all right. uh, the Easter candle, the Paschal candle or the Easter candle. So there is always near the baptismal font, there's this large candle. Um, and a, a flame is taken from this candle, this large candle, to the small candle that the parents or godparents are, are holding on behalf of the child. The large candle, the Paschal candle, is, um, is blessed uh, on, at the Easter vigil every year in the church. So um, it, there's a whole ritual around it, but the idea is that the church is in complete darkness, Anyone who's been to the Easter Vigil will know that there's a fire and the fire is blessed and then the candle is blessed and then a fire is taken from, a light is taken from that fire and the candle is lit. And then the people who are there all have a little candle in their hand and from that one candle, the light is spread out among all the others. And suddenly you go from darkness into complete light. Um, and it's the idea of the darkness of the tomb of Christ and the light of the resurrection. So there's a lot of symbolism in that candle because at the Easter vigil, that candle is symbolic of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who spreads his light and his life to all the members of the church. Uh, so he is uh, what St. Uh, Paul, I think, calls him the firstborn from the dead. 
the firstborn, not the only born, the firstborn. And we are reborn in baptism. So there's this connection with the Paschal candle, the, uh, the Easter candle, that with baptism, there is a link. So what do we believe? We believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead for us and for our salvation. This is kind of central to our belief. Um, and so at the baptismal rite, the light on that large candle is a symbol of the light of Christ. It's a symbol of the gift of faith that ignites in the soul when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. The gift of faith is there. As it's a fire um, or likened to a fire. And so first of all, the idea of the light of Christ the light of Christ pours into the depths of the soul of the newly baptized. So Jesus Christ says in the Gospels, I am the light of the world. And then he says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. Well, which is it? It's both. The light of Christ in us is Christ's oh. light. And that begins with baptism. So there's twice in a person's life when that candle is lit for them or maybe I'd better say twice on their earthly journey. It's always there beside the baptismal font, but it's also there beside their coffin at mass, the same candle. You know, if you've been to a funeral uh, at the funeral mass, uh, the large candle is there somewhere near the, the remains um, and it's burning brightly. And so the church is actually trying to make a symbolic link that this person, they're brought in there, uh, uh, their coffin, their mortal remains are brought into the mass where we're commending their, their mortal, immortal soul to, to uh, God's mercy. The church is saying at baptism, so we'll say this man is Patrick, okay? He's recently deceased, it's his funeral. So at baptism, the light of Christ entered Patrick's soul. He has carried the flame of faith. So that's the symbolic of taking the light from that and hand it to the godparents and parents. He has, it was carried by his parents and godparents to begin with. Then he took that flame of faith for himself and he carried it through his life. And that flame of faith at the end of his life is still intact. So at baptism, the light of Christ entered his soul. Now at his funeral, we the people of God are praying that his soul may now enter the full glorious light of Christ. So in baptism, the light of Christ into us at our death, we want entry into the eternal light of Christ. And that's symbolized by, by that, uh, that, that candle. And um, the prayer that said, or the words that are spoken to the parents of God, parents, as the light is taken from the, the Paschal candle to the small candle that they have. It says, parents and godparents, this light is entrusted to you to be kept burning brightly. So it's entrusted to the parents and godparents. This child of yours has been enlightened by Christ. There's that idea of the light of Christ has entered them. He is to walk always as a child of the light. And then this is a biblical uh, Allusion, uh, alluding to the idea of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the wise and foolish virgins. And some had their lamps lit and some hadn't any oil in their lamps. So the next part is, may he keep the flame of faith alive in his heart when the Lord comes. And when does he come? Either at the end of time or at the end of my time on this earth at my death. When the Lord comes, may he go out to meet him with all the saints in, he in the heavenly kingdom. So this idea, we're giving you this light as a symbol of the faith that has been given to this child. He is to walk always as a child of the light, walk always as a faithful disciple of Christ, so that when Christ returns, that flame of faith will be burning brightly in his soul, and he will go out to meet the Lord, joyfully to be embraced by the Lord, and to be embraced by the light of eternity. Um, but it's saying it's entrusted you, God, godparents and parents, so that you may facilitate and enable this child to walk 
as a child of the light. Of course, this refers to then, do they know their dignity? Do they know where they come from? You know, that they are created in the image and likeness of God and God willed them before he created a single atom in this universe. God willed that they would exist. Do they know where they come from? That they are, are the result of a, the creative love of our God. But then do they know where they're headed? So they know where they come from. They know who they are. I'm a child of God. And I know my destiny. And God wants me to be with him forever. You know, if you don't know where you come from, don't know where you are and don't know where you're going, that's kind of like a definition for somebody who's lost. Mm. And so we have to make sure that parents and godparents know that they have to facilitate that the child knows who he is or who she is and what's their destiny. Um, so that lighted candle, really, really Im important. Uh, the catechism, I have a quote from the catechism for that, okay? Uh, no, I, I don't have a quote from the catechism. I, I do have one, but I'm not sure of how relevant it is. Um, yeah, the great. I think I quoted this in the first video. For the grace of baptism to unfold, the parents' help is important. So too is the role of the godfather and godmother who must be firm believers, able and ready to help the newly baptized child or adult on the road of Christian life. So there, once again, the idea is you have to help this child. How can he carry the light of Christ if he doesn't even know he has it? If he doesn't know that he's supposed to walk as a disciple of Christ? Um, so, um, so there's a lot going on in, in, in that in that little ritual, that's not just, you know, this is the baptismal candle, isn't it night, nice? It's like a birthday candle on a cake. No, uh, it's symbolism is much, much deeper. Um, uh, that that, that in, uh, a portion, uh, in a certain sense, this little flame comes from that big flame, this little candle from that big candle, because there is a union forged there. So the, the life of the spirit in Christ in Christ Jesus is also the same life in the spirit that this child is being baptized into. And then he or she has to be enabled, empowered, facilitated by primarily parents and godparents to be able to walk that walk of faith for themselves so that they will find themselves. We all walk with that flame and the, the winds of the world and our own weakness kind of endanger that flame. From, from time to time, the life, the light of Christ can even in a certain sense be extinguished by mortal sin, for example, but it can always be reignited. But the, the gift of faith remains um, through all of that. Um, might be just in potential, but, uh, but it's there. Um, and so there may be times when we walk our walk of faith, when our, when our, this little light of mine is not a light anymore, you know, uh, so it needs to be reignited um, and then let it shine. Um, and then also to realize that, you know, a city built on a hilltop, Jesus says, cannot be hidden. So, uh, you know, as Christians, we're not anonymous and we're not invisible. We're not meant to be invisible. We're not meant to blend in. We're meant to stand out. Um, so that, the, so that, the light of Christ will shine out of our lives, not for our glory that people think, oh, isn't he so holy? But so that they will see who it is we follow, who inspires us, who empowers us to be the people that others might admire and see things admirable in our lives because they go, oh, as they did in the early church, see how this Christian loves, see how he loves, how does he, what, what is his motivation? And your life, the light of Christ shining in your life may provoke others to ask the question of themselves or maybe you, why are you different? Why are you different? You know, in the midst of this pandemic, when everybody's afraid and people are panicking, why are you so calm? This was asked of a friend of mine uh, less than a year ago now. And his simple answer was, because I have Jesus and I'm not worried. 
there's there's a simple way in which the light of Christ can just pop out of our life and illuminate others who are maybe struggling in in with with a darker kind of experience of the hardships of life. Uh, so walk the walk of faith, discipleship, uh, the light of Christ um, begins at baptism and then reaches its fulfillment with our death. It's terrible to end on that, but actually death is not the worst thing that can happen to us because from heaven's perspective, it's now the best thing because it's our entrance into glory. Please, God. That's fascinating, Father Philip, because just... Uh, just in your very uh, last point there you know whenever we're praying the rosary the uh, predicting the glorious mysteries the second glorious mystery the ascension of Jesus into heaven it's always for me it's always meditating on like one of the last commands that Jesus gave uh, in that piece of scripture was go out and make disciples of all nations more uh, more or less Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like that there just to bring the light of Christ to the world by our actions in our vocations, in how we live and how we love. Um, and that it's fascinating. Like, just before we wind up now, I remember there was a quote from Archbishop Fulton Sheen. And now I'm not probably going to, I'm probably not going to give it the, the just that it deserves, but it was something along the lines of if everybody knew exactly the correct teachings of what the church teaches and why there probably wouldn't be 10 people in the world that would reject the church. And it's very much like what you were saying here, just listening to the explanation of what's happening in the sacrament of baptism. If people, I think of a lot, a majority of people understood what exactly is happening, why it's happening, and they accepted it. Wow, gosh, there wouldn't be that extinguished light walking around in so many uh, baptized people who are not practicing and, 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 so many of them probably are not practicing maybe through no fault of their own, but it was just never fully explained and the, there was no one there to, to to nurture and the faith. So even for me as a parent, listen to you talk there, wow, like there's a there's such a challenge and responsibility there. And uh, listen, thank you so much. Um, I know I, I got over it for 20 yeah. minutes. We're way over, over time. time but look, thank you so, so, so much. <laughs> Uh, no, I really appreciate you giving your time, uh, for Father Philip, because that was absolutely fascinating. I'm not just saying it there now. As you were speaking, like it was almost the hair standing in the back of, your, uh, of my neck and the heart beating and going, wow, wow, wow. It was just uh, uh, amazing. So thank you. Thank you for giving me your time. You're welcome, Brian. Just to finally just say, you can go to a baptism and think that that's a nice ritual. But the ritual is there not to be nice not to be, you know, oh, it looks nice, it unfolds in a nice way. The ritual is there to communicate the truths of our faith that we believe about the sacrament. And the same is true of all of the sacraments, that there's a ritual in which which all of these sacraments unfold, but they can just remain at the level of that's a nice ceremony. Unless we actually go, well, why does the church do it that way why does it not do it a different way because if it did it a different way it would be communicating a different doctrine perhaps it wouldn't be compatible with what the church actually believes about uh about that sacrament so you know if in any way this has helped anybody get a little doorway into the sacrament of baptism wonderful uh wonderful uh uh, but I would highly encourage you to, uh, you know, there are a lot of resources in that. You can go to other sacraments, things of, if you've ever asked about any of the sacraments, why do they do it that way? Go and explore, because it's not just done that way to look nice or to feel nice. It's trying to communicate some truth um, or some reality that is not visible, um, but is really present and active in that in that sacrament so that's fantastic father philip father philip just before we end could i ask you to lead us in a, in a closing prayer yes in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen we begin in the trinity because we began our life of faith in the trinity with baptism heavenly father 
most of us listening to this have been baptized. And so we are your sons and daughters in Christ Jesus. We are new creations, temples of the Holy Spirit, and we give you thanks and praise for this great gift. And we ask that this great gift may be given to more and more souls throughout the world this day. We ask you to awaken in us a great zeal for our dignity in Christ Jesus and a great desire to live in a way that is according to our dignity as baptized Christians. Heavenly Father, we are all your children. And we call out to you now in the words that Jesus taught us. We are co-heirs with him. And so he taught us to pray to you, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may Almighty God bless Amen. you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Philip. You're welcome. God bless. 